Hello, my name is Morgan. I am a registered nurse, and I'd like to welcome you to the third and final video of our HIV series. I'm happy to partner with Picmonic to bring you these videos. If you haven't seen the first two, I recommend going back and uh, viewing those because these videos build on each other. I am a registered nurse with a specialty certification in HIV and AIDS. You can find me on Instagram at The Teachable Nurse or my website www.theteachablenurse.com. Like I said before, the first two videos in this series talked about HIV, what it is, how it replicates in the body, and the medications used to treat and prevent it. This video will discuss conditions that may arise due to untreated HIV called opportunistic infections. We will also cover some of the most common sexually transmitted diseases and how they relate to HIV. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all the possible opportunistic infections that can co-occur with HIV, but these are ones commonly seen in the clinical setting. It's also important to note that these diseases that we discuss in this video can occur in people who do not have HIV. Before we begin, let's review the CD4 cell and its role in the immune system. CD4 cells are part of the immune system that help fight off infections. You want to have a high number of CD4 cells in your body, around 400 to 1500. But when HIV invades the CD4 cells, they take over the cell and your body loses those CD4 cells. Without those infection fighting cells, your body is more vulnerable. If you imagine your immune system as a frontline army, HIV viruses are the enemy. And with less soldiers on the front line, HIV and other viruses can overtake the army pretty easily and get into the body and invade it. And when this happens, the body doesn't have a strong enough immune system to get rid of them. This can then lead to hospitalization and possibly death. Let's begin this discussion of opportunistic infections, which I will refer to as OIs, with pneumocystis pneumoniae. Pneumocystis pneumoniae, also known as PCP, is a type of pneumonia infection. It's a fungal infection diagnosed with a bronchoalveolar lavage or a lung biopsy. The fungus in question is known as pneumocystic gyrovici. People whose immune systems are not compromised may live with this disease for many years and not even realize it. However, once the body's immune system is affected by things like corticosteroids, which are known to suppress the immune system, or with HIV, the fungal infection can no longer remain stagnant, and so it begins to replicate in the body. It can be contagious, and someone with a weakened immune system may get it from someone just carrying the infection around in their lungs. To diagnose PCP, the provider will perform that lavage I talked about, which involves rinsing the patient's lungs with a fluid and then pulling that fluid back up to get a sample and test it. It can also be diagnosed using a sputum sample from the patient's lungs in which the patient really has to cough up and give that sputum sample. And it has to be a really good sample for them to be able to diagnose it. The other option for diagnosing this illness is a lung biopsy. So in this case, the provider takes a sample of lung tissue, then sends it to the lab to see if it has PCP DNA. This disease is treated with antifungals because it is a fungal infection, such as TMP-SMX. Now let's discuss Mycobacterium avium complex. Mycobacterium avian complex, or MAC, consists of two microorganisms, M. avium and M. intracellulare. These are found in water, food, and soil. Patients usually contract MAC when they have ingested soiled water or accidentally ingest soil from playing in the dirt or, you know, being somewhere where there's not fresh water and accidentally ingesting it. MAC infects both the gastrointestinal tract and the respiratory tract, causing HIV monocytes to replicate with the infection, leading to disseminated MAC. And disseminated just means it goes other places in the body. 
Disseminated MAC usually occurs when a patient's CD4 count drops below 50, and therefore it's rare for someone to contract MAC to the extent of severe dissemination unless they already have a diagnosis of AIDS. Signs and symptoms include pneumonia-like symptoms, fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, chills, and thick sputum in the lungs. If the infection occurs in the GI tract, then the symptoms involve the gut, including abdominal pain, diarrhea, and can even eventually lead to anemia. MAC is a bacterial infection and can be diagnosed using a CT scan, a biopsy, and blood tests. MAC can present similarly to tuberculosis. After all, they are both a type of mycobacterium infection, and therefore a differential diagnosis is needed to determine if someone has tuberculosis or if they have MAC. Possible treatments for MAC include azithromycin, moxifloxacin, rifabutin, or rifampin, and these are all antibiotics. If the patient has not already begun ART treatment, then ART is initiated at the same time as treatment. Remember, ART stands for antiretroviral therapy, and that's the medications used to treat HIV. Additionally, MAC prophylaxis may be prescribed to people diagnosed with AIDS who have not presented symptoms of MAC, but are at a higher risk for contracting it based on their CD4 count. Drugs used to treat MAC have a high drug interaction profile, meaning they are likely to interact negatively with other drugs and or drug classes. And therefore, it's important for the prescriber and the nurse to conduct a comprehensive medication reconciliation with the patient, which just means reviewing their medication list. Now I'll transition to talking about progressive multifocal leukinoencephalopathy. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy also known as PML, is a disease affecting the brain, and signs include declining mental function, visual changes, and declining motor function. It is a demyelinating disease, meaning it damages the myelin sheath or covering of those nerve fibers in the brain. It's caused by the JC virus, named after the initials of the first patient known to have this virus which is something we all can have from an early age in our body. However, it remains latent unless our bodies experience severe immunosuppression. We usually pick up this virus when we're younger through the oral fecal route or the respiratory route. It is diagnosed with an MRI or a lumbar puncture. At first, people with this disease begin exhibiting worsening cognitive impairment and even personality changes. Lesions appear on an MRI of the brain, and the location of those lesions implies which cranial nerves are likely to be affected. Beginning antiretroviral therapy is the best way to treat this condition. There is no prophylactic treatment, and there isn't a specific medication regimen to treat PML specifically. If a person with a known HIV diagnosis presents with fever and neurologic deficits, PML should be considered and the diagnostic imaging should be ordered immediately. Many times, PML cannot be cured and therefore end-of-life care should be initiated. On the topic of diseases affecting the brain, next is cryptococcal meningitis. Cryptococcal meningitis is caused by a fungus called cryptococcus, usually found in bird droppings. It can be transmitted by accidentally ingesting this fungus due to poor hand hygiene, and this type of cryptococcal fungus is known as C. neoformans. The other less common cryptococcal fungus is known as C. gatti, G-A-T-T-I, and it resides in plants like eucalyptus. It's not contagious, so you cannot spread it to someone else. It lives on surfaces, therefore, uh, like fomites. So a fomite is an inanimate object that can carry a disease and you can touch it and then that's how it's transmitted. So some signs and symptoms of cryptococcal meningitis include lethargy, sensitivity to light, headache, and nausea and vomiting. And if you think about it, that makes sense because this fungal infection is affecting the meninges, which live in our brain. And this OI is diagnosed using a cryptococcal antigen test. It's diagnosed after a doctor takes a sample of cerebral spinal fluid by performing a lumbar puncture. The treatment used in this case is amphotericin B, flucytosine, or fluconazole. 
All three of these medications are antifungals and must be given intravenously. If the patient goes home from the hospital and still needs these drugs, they're given a central line or pick line, which is like a long lasting IV. It goes um, home with them so that these medications can be given over a long period of time, days, weeks, months even. So infotericin B has a really high adverse reaction profile and can be very damaging to the kidneys. Therefore, it's extremely important to monitor kidney function while the patient is taking this drug. This next opportunistic infection is possibly one that people have heard the most about. Kaposi's sarcoma, or KS, was commonly seen during the onset of the AIDS epidemic when there was no treatment for the virus. KS was actually seen in patients as early as the late 1970s, though doctors were stumped as to what it indicated. While it is not as commonly seen today upon diagnosis, KS is still an OI that should be addressed and prevented when possible. Signs and symptoms include skin lesions and pulmonary changes. It's caused by a herpes virus called HHV8, and is diagnosed with a biopsy or chest x-ray. When the HHV8 slash KSV, Kaposi Sarcoma virus, infects the endothelial cells, the virus's proteins trigger an inflammatory response. And though KS is visible on the skin, it affects internal organs as well. KS can attack the lungs, liver, and most commonly the gastrointestinal tract. It's important to take a biopsy from one of the lesions before diagnosing a patient with KS since many different diseases can present with similar lesions. Once KS is identified, the provider may prescribe medications like Foscarnet and Gancyclovir since they both seem to be effective against the KSV and HHV8. If only a few lesions are present, uh, topical solutions may be prescribed and work just fine. When KS has invaded the body and the disease progresses, it is treated by starting antiretroviral therapy, but because it is a sarcoma, chemotherapy and radiation may be necessary. Nurses and caregivers should be aware that the impact of lesions on the skin can really affect a patient's self-esteem and the way that they view themselves. And therefore, interventions such as using cosmetics to hide the lesions may be useful to the patient. Let's transition from talking about opportunistic infections to discussing other common sexually transmitted diseases. I will be talking about three. Syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. These are not the only STDs, but are common and important to talk about when discussing HIV. HIV and other STDs are sometimes co-identified when people get screened for STDs and therefore could have more than one diagnosis at a time. Let's start with syphilis. Syphilis is a systemic bacterial infection caused by Treponema pallidum. There are three stages of syphilis, primary, secondary, and tertiary. HIV transmission may increase two to nine-fold in people with primary syphilis, and this is why it's really important when screening for STDs to screen for all STDs. Primary syphilis appears as a sore on the skin of the genitals and may resolve on its own. However, the infection itself does not resolve without treatment. These sores, known as chancre, may also present in mucous membranes in the genitals or mouth. Primary syphilis can last as long as 90 days before turning into secondary syphilis, but people may have secondary syphilis at the same time as they have primary. Secondary syphilis also shows up as sores, but can also present as a maculopapular rash on the extremities. This rash on the palms is a telltale sign of secondary syphilis. During these stages of syphilis, it's also common for the patient to experience lymphadenopathy. Syphilis can actually go latent after the second stage, and patients may think that they have resolved their infection, but they haven't. Tertiary syphilis presents with central and peripheral nervous system symptoms, including eye and ear disturbances, heart disease, and changes in cognition which leads me to neurosyphilis. Neurosyphilis is a complication of syphilis and may present as severe cognitive disturbances, including dementia, seizures, hallucinations, and loss of bowel and bladder function. 
When providers are testing for syphilis, they will test for the presence of the bacteria using the rapid plasma reagent or RPR test. This test can also inform the provider if syphilis treatment has been successful. Another test called a treponemal test will remain positive after the patient has been treated. Therefore, a positive treponemal result does not necessarily indicate an active syphilis infection. They must have an RPR test in order to determine an active infection. Providers will order bicillin injections, known as benzathine penicillin, given intramuscularly to treat syphilis. Different doses of bicillin are given based on the stage of the syphilis infection. Patients with neurosyphilis are typically initially hospitalized and receive treatment through an IV. Nurses and providers must inform their patients that it's important to inform any partner exposed within 90 days of their diagnosis and refrain from sexual intercourse until treatment is complete. Now let's talk about gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted disease caused by the bacteria Neisseria gonorrhea. When someone contracts gonorrhea, they may experience painful urination, pus-like discharge from the penis, pain in one testicle, and abdominal or pelvic pain. Gonorrhea can also infect the throat, eyes, rectum, and joints. The risk of leaving gonorrhea untreated includes infertility due to the inflammation gonorrhea can cause in the sperm ducts and in the fallopian tubes. When people contract gonorrhea, they should inform their partners who may have also been exposed and refrain from sexual activity until treatment is complete. Providers will order ceftriaxone to treat gonorrhea. The nurse can administer this as an intramuscular injection. After the ceftriaxone is pulled up into a syringe, it will be diluted in lidocaine before administration. Chlamydia is the last sexually transmitted disease we will be discussing. Chlamydia is caused by the bacteria Chlamydia trichomatis. The main distinction chlamydia and other STDs is that it can frequently present with no symptoms. People may have chlamydia for years before they realize it. Because of this, it is important to encourage patients to get screened for STDs, including chlamydia, if they have multiple partners or unprotected sex. When chlamydia does present with symptoms, women usually exhibit pain with intercourse and discharge from the vagina, and men present with swelling in testicles and or discharge from the penis. Burning with urination is also common with both men and women. Chlamydia is diagnosed by testing a urine sample and can be treated with oral azithromycin or doxycycline. This concludes the three-part video series on HIV.